Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today, Intel has finally taken the wraps off their new Tiger Lake U-series processors for laptops and other mobile devices. We've seen leaks for these CPUs for months now. Intel also talked about the Tiger Lake architecture in a presentation several weeks ago. Today, we are getting the full feature set, the SKU list, and also benchmark data from Intel. There are some interesting announcements here surrounding their SKUs and products. However, there are also some highly dubious benchmark and performance claims littered throughout this presentation, which we'll talk about a bit later. Some of this stuff is truly baffling, so <laughs> stay tuned for a deep analysis of their claims. Anyway, so let's start with the basic information on Tiger Lake and the U-series parts. Like previous Intel U-series chips, power configurations for these parts range from 7 watts through to 28 watts. Intel has simplified the lineup a bit so that there's no longer exclusive 28 watt parts. All of the mainstream U-series chips can be configured from 12 to 28 watts, and then the lower power variants go from 7 to 15 watts. Nothing more powerful is being announced today. These are firmly low power chips for ultra portable laptops. A lot of the announcements in this presentation also aren't really news, so we're not gonna cover them in detail again. If you're interested in more information, I suggest checking out our Tiger Lake architecture video. But anyway, the main thing here is that Tiger Lake uses a new CPU architecture, Willow Cove, which is mostly focused on beefing up the cache system and other areas to the design. Intel are not reporting IPC gains for this design over Sunny Cove, the chips used in their last gen Ice Lake processors. We're also seeing the usage of Intel's refreshed 10 nanometer super thin process technology, which allows Tiger Lake to clock much higher than previous generation parts within the same power envelope. The efficiency gains touted are impressive, although that's relative to the previous 10 nanometer node, which was a bit of a fail. Then we also get new XE graphics, an updated display engine, support for Thunderbolt 4, PCIe 4.0, and all that sort of thing. What Intel hasn't detailed before now is the full SKU list, and we're getting that today. Once again, the naming scheme is absolutely horrible here, in keeping with Intel's Ice Lake naming. So unfortunately, Intel hasn't learned much here, and a lot of these part names will remain very confusing for customers that want to know the actual differences between parts. In the 12 to 28 watt class, we have parts such as the Core i7 1185G7, Core i5 1135G7, and Core i3 1115G4. Anytime you see a 5 in that final digit before the G number, that indicates a 12 to 28 watt part. Then there's also the Core i7-1160G7, Core i5-1130G7, and so on, with the zero in that digit indicating a 7 to 15 watt part. This makes it far harder to distinguish the full power from low power parts, which used to have either U or Y suffixes. If you're not paying attention, you could easily miss that the Core i7-1165G7 is actually different from the Core i7-1160G7. To make matters worse this generation, the G numbering no longer makes sense either. With Ice Lake, we had either G7, G4, or G1 branding. G7 meant the full 64 execution units, G4 meant 48 execution units, and G1 meant 32. That's no longer the case with Tiger Lake. G7 can now either mean 96 or 80 execution units, as evidenced by the difference between the Core i7-1165G7 and Core i5-1135G7. Intel has also ditched G1 branding, using G4 to mean 48 execution units. If you were totally confused after this explanation, I don't blame you, the naming scheme is terrible. Luckily, I don't expect OEMs to use all of these SKUs. Historically, they've stuck to just using one model from each of the Core i7, i5, and i3 ranges, so that will simplify it a bit when buying a device. Unfortunately, the stupid naming takes away from what is an impressive gen-on-gen -gen improvement to specifications. We're still seeing four cores here maximum, with eight threads, in all but some of the Core i3 range, which remains dual core. However, clock speeds are much higher than with Ice Lake. Where the Core i7-1065G7 topped out at a 1.3 GHz base clock and 3.9 GHz turbo, Tiger Lake is bringing a 2.8 GHz base clock and 4.7 GHz turbo. That increases up to a 3.0 GHz base and 4.8 GHz boost with the Core i7-1185G7. However, what is absolutely crucial to note here is that you can't really do a direct gen-on-gen -gen comparison with base clocks. This is because Ice Lake's base clock were centered around a 15 watt default TDP. So while you got 1.3 gigahertz at 15 watts, 
that dropped to 1 gigahertz at 12 watts and increased to 1.5 gigahertz at 25 watts. Intel aren't offering a default TDP anymore, only giving base clocks for the maximum and minimum values. And what they're quoting here in this table is the maximum base clock for the 28 watt version. When you head over to Arc, you'll see that the i7 1165G7 has a 2.8 gigahertz base at 28 watts, but a 1.2 gigahertz base at 12 watts. So in an apples to apples configuration, you won't see 1.5 gigahertz higher clock speeds like the difference in base clocks may suggest. Judging by some quick comparisons I did between SKUs, the base clock differences in power equivalent configurations appear to be roughly between 700 megahertz and one gigahertz. Still, when combined with a large increase to turbo frequencies, up to 700 megahertz higher than ice lakes best, that presents a huge gain to clocks that could easily deliver 20% higher frequencies in applications. The GPU is much stronger here as well and is perhaps the most impressive part about Tiger Lake. The maximum configuration not only brings a 50% increase to execution units, up to 96 execution units this time around, clock speeds have also increased up to 1.3 gigahertz for the 1165G7 and 1.35 gigahertz for the 1185G7. That's nearly a 20% gain to clocks on top of the 50 percent increase to execution units, although how much of these clocks are accessible at TDPs below 28 watts remains to be seen. The memory system isn't improved significantly though, DDR4-3200 is still standard here for all parts, and then LPDDR4X support is increased to 4266 on everything but the Core i3-1125G4 and i3-1115G4, which remains at 3733 speeds. Intel's plan here with Tiger Lake to combat AMD's Ryzen Mobile 4000 is mostly centered around frequencies and a B for your GPU. While Ryzen has doubled the core count in their flagship parts, up to 8 cores in their Ryzen 7, range, Intel are pushing higher single core clocks and giving a healthy all core boost over Ice Lake. However, we won't get a clear idea of what clock speeds Tiger Lake actually uses until we get hands on time. The all core turbo measurements and turbo measurements in general are not very useful as U series products only hit those clocks briefly and it can depend a lot on what you've previously been doing on your laptop, the power management, all that sort of thing. From here though, it's all a bit downhill for Intel's Tiger Lake presentation because there are a number of, I'll be honest, not very good benchmarks used to highlight the performance advantage Tiger Lake supposedly holds over Ryzen Mobile. Now I don't know at this point whether Tiger Lake is faster or slower than Ryzen Mobile. In my opinion they'd have to make up a significant amount of ground to beat AMD in some CPU workloads, but the examples Intel are using here don't present a very good picture of the actual differences. So let's break down some of the charts. In this one, Intel describes leadership benchmark performance. A key one is Firestrike, where they show a 67% increase over the Ryzen 7 4800U. No problems with that, 3D Mark is a widely used benchmark. However, Sysmark performance is not relevant in my opinion, and shouldn't be used as a benchmark given there have been numerous accusations of this benchmark cheating in favor of Intel, with a dubious history of Sysmark's developer BAPCO's close relationship with Intel. Even if these accusations are false, Intel are opening themselves right up to criticism here for using a benchmark that many consider tainted. They could have just swapped this out for something else. This next one, again claiming leadership real world performance is also odd. For example, Intel are leveraging their Wi-Fi and Thunderbolt integration to deliver supposedly higher performance over AMD. However, there is nothing stopping an OEM using either Wi-Fi 6 or Thunderbolt in their AMD designs. Given that Thunderbolt 4 presents no real bandwidth improvement over Thunderbolt 3, this is a misleading claim in my opinion. In fact, suggesting an Intel processor can download files over Wi-Fi three times faster than an AMD processor is absolute garbage, as AMD and Intel systems can really just use the same sort of Wi-Fi chips. Next up we have a video editing workflow showing the Core i7-1185G7 beating the Ryzen 7 4800U by 2x in what appears to be Premiere. Intel are clearly leveraging their superior QuickSync support in this workload using a 4K 60fps 10-bit HEVC file for this test. While AMD does also support hardware accelerated encoding of these sorts of files, Adobe's support for it in Premiere is mediocre at best and could use some improvements. It'll be interesting to see how that performance 
holds up under different but similar workloads. Not saying Premiere isn't a relevant workload because it's not. Lots of people use Premiere for video editing, but it'll be interesting to see how different configurations of Premiere hold up and also how other video editing workloads like say DaVinci Resolve also perform. We also have more Sysmark numbers here, which Intel claims is an industry benchmark. In my opinion, if Intel wanted to use an industry benchmark, the spec suite would have been more appropriate. The next one I want to look at here are Intel's AI benchmarks, comparing the Core i7-1185G7 to the Ryzen 7 4800U. Now I have no doubt that Tiger Lake is faster than Ryzen for AI workloads, as Tiger Lake has built-in AI accelerators here, while Ryzen does not. But I have question marks over how relevant this is in a mobile form factor and how real world this sort of benchmark is. Intel love to talk about real world performance benchmarks and have criticized reviewers for testing with say Cinebench in the past. Now they were using Topaz Labs Gigapixel AI Photo Upscale and Nero AI Photo Tagger for a benchmark of their own. It seems pretty hypocritical of Intel to talk about how Cinebench is not representative of real world performance only to turn around and use an AI upscaling benchmark to show how much faster Tiger Lake is. This to me is definitely a niche workload and not something an average consumer would be doing with their laptop. And normally, I wouldn't have any problems with the company trying to show benchmarks that highlight new innovative features they've added to their processes. Tiger Lake having AI acceleration is an advantage the chip has. But I find this emphasis on AI performance particularly hard to swallow after their previous marketing attempts around real world benchmarking. Some of the best and potentially most realistic benchmarks in this presentation were their gaming benchmarks. We are getting a wide range of games shown here, and these comparisons versus Isolake are totally what I would be expecting given the large difference in GPU capabilities between these chips. The performance compared to AMD is also potentially not unreasonable, although I'm not sure this is a power equalized test, Intel only claiming to have tested using the highest available power profile on their Ryzen test system, so who knows whether this is a 15 watt or 25 watt configuration or whatever. Independent benchmarking will clarify the performance differences here, but given the improvements to XE graphics with Tiger Lake, I'd be expecting a fierce battle and an area where Intel will be highly competitive. Intel also claimed that many titles are playable on their XE GPU at 1080p, with average performance ranging from 30 FPS to well over 60 FPS in some esports titles. I'm assuming most of these are low quality presets, but even then, this is an impressive claim to make. We've seen big gains to our GPU performance over the last few generations, and yet, yeah, I'd be hoping that with Tiger Lake, we'll see a lot of games performing well enough on a U-series laptop to be somewhat enjoyable. Intel in this presentation twice mentioned streaming performance as well, with both game streaming and lifestyle streaming showing the performance benefits over Ryzen. Again, normally I wouldn't have too much of a problem with companies trying to show the advantages of their parts, but streaming on a U-series laptop is a niche task, especially game streaming. I would not class this as a real-world benchmark for this sort of device, and I again find it a bit hypocritical that Intel are now turning to these sorts of workloads to show off their processes. Next up, we have more benchmarks showing productivity performance, although a lot of these tests are Sysmark, which we've already talked about, as well as WebXPRT, which is another Intel favorite. The most relevant information here is PCMark 10's applications workload, which is a benchmark that AMD has admitted that they don't have leading performance in, which is why I'm sure it's being used here. That said, it can be a decent representation of productivity performance, and Intel are showing a solid lead here on Ryzen which given the high single core frequencies Tiger Lake can hit, is to be expected. The AMD configuration is still unclear, so take these results with a grain of salt. We'll clarify them in a power equal configuration when we do our own benchmarking. The two following slides are again just AI related benchmarks, big win here for Intel, although again, I'd question the relevance for a mobile form factor. And the final thing I wanted to highlight out of this presentation is the scalability of Tiger Lake. Intel are claiming up to a 37% performance increase in 3D Mark Time Spy when moving from a 15 watt to 28 watt power limit, and up to 33% when gaming with grid. That's decent scaling. Although I do find it curious both workloads are gaming related and different to a previous slide showing Ice Lake scaling. It's unclear to me why they would change benchmarks between these two slides. We'll have to see how scaling actually is in say CPU limited workloads, which is not really what these benchmarks for Tiger Lake are showing. Oh, and principal technologies pops up again in their disclaimer slide. Surely, surely they would want to avoid any association with them at this point. So yeah, this presentation, 
it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's great to see the actual SKU list and specifications for new Tiger Lake processors, but despite Intel showing lots and lots of benchmarks, I walked away without a good feel for how Tiger Lake compares to other processors on the market. A lot of the time, the focus was on comparing Tiger Lake to Ryzen in unclear configurations while using as many of Intel's accelerators as possible, most of which need specific application support to harness. The focus on AI was a bit laughable given their real-world performance focus of old, as is the continual usage of benchmark suites like Sysmark, which you can pretty much ignore at this point. What we're left with is just a few PCMark application workloads and gaming results to go on, and while the gaming performance looks very promising, ultimately I've really no idea how general performance stacks up to Ryzen, that's how much muddying of the waters and irrelevant benchmarks were seen here. What was also interesting is Intel's focus on comparing Tiger Lake to Ryzen as opposed to Ice Lake. AMD did this as well in their Ryzen Mobile 4000 launch, focusing directly on the competition rather than their previous generation efforts. I suspect that Intel, like AMD, are a bit embarrassed by how inferior their last gen products look. I mean, Intel have achieved clock speeds that are over a gigahertz higher at times, according to their spec sheet. What I'm most excited about with Tiger Lake now is just to get it on the benchmark table so we can get a proper look at how performance stacks up to Ice Lake and Ryzen Mobile 4000. The fact that Intel have shied away from more comprehensive CPU benchmarking suggests there might be a few worries in that camp, while the focus on gaming, in contrast, suggests Intel are confident that they have a lead in that area. It will be a very interesting investigation and ultimately, having competition in the mobile market is good news for everyone. Tiger Lake laptop announcements will begin flooding out today, although availability isn't expected for a little while. I've heard a range of times from late September through to November for most launches. If you're interested in our benchmarks, that's the sort of time frame you can be expecting for those. So that's it for this look at the Tiger Lake launch, another launch to look at. We of course covered the GeForce RTX 3000 stuff yesterday, so if you missed that, go back and check that one out. You can of course as well subscribe for the rest of our news coverage. We'll probably be back next week to talk more about news, the latest developments from that week. We have our Patreon page as well if you want to support the channel directly, access to our Discord chat, monthly live streams, all that sort of thing. And yeah, that's it. I'll catch you in the next one.